Thank you, Bill. Absolutely love that song. I want to summarize the book of 1 Peter for you. You probably can do it after all the months that we've been together in this book. Very simply, I remind you that God is building a big house. It's an invisible house called His church. And that church is spanning the globe this morning. It's made up of every tribe and nation and tongue upon the earth. And God himself is populating his big house with lots of children. That's why Jesus said, in my Father's house are many rooms, many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He's planning on having lots of kids. But he is the one who populates his house through the miracle of the new birth. And when you become a child in God's family, you are automatically ordained as a priest. So we are a family of priests who are offering sacrifices of praise to God that are made acceptable through Jesus Christ. But this family of priests are in exile in a hostile world that hates God and hates the message that he proclaims. But even though this family of priests are exiles in a hostile world, God expects them to model the humble and gentle attitude of the elder son in the family, Jesus Christ. Now today I want to move on to a new part of the story, which is that God's family has one single oath to which they pledge their allegiance. They have one message that they proclaim. It is the controlling, compelling, commanding message that is the cornerstone of their theology and their methodology. It's the one thing that you should hear every Sunday when you come to this church. And it is simply the message that the early church preached. Jesus is Lord. That's the message of the church. It's in the text that we'll study together this morning. But before we go there, I want to remind you that this, mess, this single message alone is the controlling, compelling, commanding theology and methodology of the church. It defines who we are. It's the cornerstone of what we're about, that Jesus Christ has been exalted as Lord. So much so that the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, every tongue in the end of the age... When time has run its course and all mankind stands before the Almighty God, the Bible says every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is what? Is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This message of His Lordship is the cornerstone of who we are and you can't miss it. That's why Paul wrote in Romans chapter 10 verse 9 that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord... And believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You shall be saved. You cannot be saved. You are not in the kingdom of God. You are not a a member of the family of God until you have settled the identity of Jesus Christ. He's not just a great teacher. He's not just a wonderful prophet. He is the son of the living God. And he is king of kings and lord of lords. So until you settle that issue you will continue to have doubts about whether or not you truly know God. It was the message of the early church. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we don't preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. The whole message of the church rises and falls on the cornerstone of, of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And it has everything to do with you personally. Because even though Jesus Christ is Lord already, you don't have to make him Lord. He is reigning, ruling Lord God Almighty. But you have to bring your life into submission to him. Peter says, as you saw him submit his life to God Almighty, you too must submit to him as your Lord. Now let's not rush. Churches are full of people who know the truth about Jesus. But they have not in reality and in practicality brought every area of their lives under the lordship and authority of Jesus Christ. So that before they think, before they speak, before they act, they consult him. They consider everything they do in light of who he is and what he has taught and what he would 
how he would be best honored in our decision-making process. So it's important. And today we're coming to a paragraph in the book of 1 Peter that has always been one of my favorites because, Peter says, in your hearts, Jesus Christ is honored as Lord. In the, in the greatest mission field of the world, it's not across the seas. It's right in this room. The greatest mission field in the world is the human heart. It is unconquerable except by the grace of God. Only God can plant hope in the dark human heart. And his hope, his plan, his desire is to plant the lordship of Jesus Christ as the controlling force, the compelling principle, the driving meaning of your life is to honor Jesus Christ as Lord. It's in 1 Peter chapter 3. Will you come with me there, please? And I want to read for you beginning in verse number 8 down to verse number 17. And I'm going to stop at verse number 17 because those of you who know the book of 1 Peter know that the next paragraph from verses 18 to the end of the chapter is by far the most difficult text in all of the book of Peter. Uh, there are some unique qualities about it. In fact, many Bible scholars say it's the most difficult passage in the entire New Testament to translate or to interpret. So I'm going to leave that for another Sunday. Maybe I'll let Max deal with that one when he comes back. Uh, but what I want to do this morning is just focus your attention on verses 8 through 17. And as always, I want to remind you that the reading of God's Word is more important than anything I have to say about it or anything you think about it. This is the Word of God. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason, for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. So Peter tells us what it's going to look like when we honor Christ as Lord. The first thing that he says in verses 8 and 9 is that you will be a harmless Christian. Would you write that down in your notes? You will be a harmless Christian. He uses five adjectives. By the way, there is no verb in this text. It's just five words that he tosses at us that should characterize a Christian. Bible scholars tell us that Peter probably used a chiasm, C-H-I-A-S-M. For those of you who are uh, literate in literacy or know uh, different uh, kinds of speech or, or writing uh, te uh, techniques or formats, you know that a chiasm, I couldn't even get it out. A chiasm is when a writer uses different thoughts to contrast with each other. Here's what I mean. The first word is contrasted against the last word. The second word is contrasted against the fourth word. And the third word is the point in the text. He's emphasizing brotherly love. He says the greatest thing that you need to have is brotherly love. And when you love each other as brothers, you will be a harmless Christian. By the way, all five of these words are very unique words in the New Testament. Uh, with one exception, they only appear this place in the New Testament. Except for the word compassion or tenderhearted, it appears twice. So Peter is choosing unique words because he's trying to say, 
Christians are unique in the way that they act. If anybody should have a humble mind, it will be a Christian. If anybody knows how to have unity, if anybody on the earth knows how to get along with other people, it should be the church. Oh, I could preach about that one. Let me show you. The word harmony is to be contrasted with the last word, humility. You need both. You need humility to have harmony. And if you have harmony, it's because somebody is humble. But the word harmony there, literally, from the Greek, simply means agreeing. Many of your versions will translate the word harmony to, to mean like-minded. Now, that's a bit of a problem, isn't it? It's not possible for everybody in this room to believe exactly the same thing about everything, is it? It's not necessarily even desirable for everybody to believe the same thing about everything. That's not even desirable. You have your favorite sports team, you have your favorite politician, you have your favorite author, you have your favorite schools, you have your favorite vacation spot, and they're nothing like mine. That doesn't make me better or worse than you. You have your favorite foods, <laughs> and I love all food. <laughs> but that's not what he's talking about. He is saying, though, you cannot be a Christian without agreeing with the body of doctrine that was revealed to the apostles and preserved in the scriptures for us. It means that you can't... Are you following me, church family? You have no right to be a cavalier Christian telling everybody what you think. It doesn't matter what you think. It matters what the Bible says. And we have cavalier preachers. They're all over southern Ontario this morning. They're telling their congregations to question the faith that has been revealed in the Word of God because they are cavalier pastors who think they have a right to make their opinion matter more than the Bible. And they're wrong. And I'd tell them to their face. I've told a few of them. We have no right to change what this book says. It's not my opinion or your opinion. We agree together on the revelation of the Scriptures. And we unite the Bible. Else you can't be a Christian. You don't get to say, I want to be a Christian, but I don't believe in the Lordship of Christ. I want to be a Christian, but I believe I can earn my way to heaven. I don't de desire or need the grace of God. I want to be a Christian, but I don't believe in the virgin birth. I want to be a Christian, but I don't believe in the inspiration, miraculous deliverance of the Bible. You cannot be a Christian. Harmony means that we all agree together. Now listen, you're not held here uh, by force, you come willingly with an open heart to say, I believe what the Bible teaches and I want to join with a congregation that is living in harmony, in unity. Notice the next word. It's the word sympathy. He contrasts that with compassion. Those two characteristics seem virtually identical to me, but they are slightly different. So the word sympathy is contrasted with compassion or a tender heart. The word sympathy means to feel what somebody else is feeling. I'm amazed at how many heartless Christians there are in the church. They can stare somebody else with a broken heart in the face and feel nothing. They haven't known what it is to cry a tear in 50 years. Sympathy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Feeling what other people feel comes from God because God is a sympathetic God. Jesus was moved by the distress and, and the depression and the discouragement that many people felt. The Bible says he was often moved to help, to serve, and a mark of what it means to be a Christian. I hope you're making the connection this morning. I'm preaching about honoring Christ as Lord. And if I honor him as Lord, I will live in harmony with other people who know him. I will seek to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, and I will carefully let the Holy Spirit develop in me the, the, the incredible ability to feel what other people are feeling so that I never have to say to someone, I never have to look someone in the face and say, I have no idea what you're going through. You should not say that to other people. You may not be in their particular situation, but the Holy Spirit can replicate in you the very heart of Jesus so that you feel what they are feeling. Then he gives his big point, which is brotherly love. It simply means to love each other as you would your earthly brother or sister. 
It's the familiar word from which the city of Philadelphia is founded, the city of brotherly love. So Peter says, if you're going to honor Christ as Lord, if Christ is honored as Lord among you as a, as a church, brotherly love will be filled and overflowing. The, the next word that he brings is the word compassion. It means to be tender-hearted. It's the same idea of sympathy, but it means that you're not a cold. Hey, listen, if you're a cold individual and people's stresses and struggles and burdens don't affect you, you should begin praying, Lord Jesus, I need you to be my Lord because obviously there's something missing over my heart. Because I need to be a tender-hearted man. I don't need to be forced to care about somebody else. I don't have to be coerced to intervene in a tragic circumstance. I will do it as a result of having a tender heart. And then the last word that he uses is the word humility. That's a hard word, isn't it? Do you know the Bible nowhere commands us to pray for humility? It tells us to humble ourselves. Uh, we don't need to ask God to humble. You should not ask God to humble you. You'll be sorry if you do. You should just be smart enough as a Christian to humble yourself now before God, before the Lordship of Christ. The word humble in this text simply means to be low. So it is biblical to say to someone, what does humility look like? It means to get low. Don't always be lifting yourself up in the conversation. Don't always be turning it back to you. Look at others. Bring yourself down. You, you need to decrease so that Christ can increase. Don't always be thinking about yourself. Now, did you notice in this text, we're talking about honoring Christ as Lord. It means that we will be harmless Christians. So harmless. You track it with me, church family? So harmless. Listen to me. So harmless that when somebody speaks evil of us, we don't just keep silent. We bless them. I was astounded at this passage because I was told as a young boy, if you can't say anything, don't, if you can't say anything good, don't say anything at all. God says, you better say something and you better say a word of blessing. That's a harmless Christian. Here's what it means. You have not received God's blessing until you have returned a word of his favor upon the very person who has hurt you. You read the text again. You go back and examine it for what it says. It doesn't mean just to be kind to them. I've learned through the years, you know more about a person by what they don't say very often than what they do say. And what Christians should always say is, may God's blessing be upon your life. I pray his favor down upon your family to the people who have reviled you, who have hurt you. And it comes from your heart. Only Jesus could produce that kind of heart. Do you see it in the text? It means to say to some. The word actually means to invoke the blessing of God upon your enemies, those who've hurt you, even the ones who are brothers and sisters in Christ who have gossiped about you, and you're bitter about it 15 years later. What you need to learn to do is bless them with the blessing of God. I've learned through the years that when people have hurt me, I'm human too, the only way I could wrestle free from the selfish pride of my own heart was to pray for God's blessing upon them by name. And I would pray it and pray it and pray it until I meant it. And I would feel God releasing me from the things that troubled me before. You see how he's talking about we're called, we're called to bless. I've no doubt that Peter was thinking about the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the peacemakers. I'm sure that's what he was thinking about when he talked about being a blessing. Now, let me just make sure that you don't misinterpret this text. He is not saying that it is ever wrong to say something that might offend somebody else. Jesus offended people all the time by telling them the truth. And he always spoke the truth in love, and lots of people were offended. I'm not talking you, to you about about going around and tickling everybody's ears. I am saying, though, when you honor Christ as Lord in your life, you become a harmless Christian. Number two, let me show you, in verses 10 through 12, you will be a blameless peacemaker. Verses 10 through 12, 
Peter draws from the historical record of Psalm 34. If you go back to Psalm 34 and read the transcription that details what Psalm 34 is about, you'll see that it was written at a time when David, who had been anointed as king of Israel by Samuel, but Saul was still the king, and Saul was jealous of David, and he was seeking to kill David, and it is during that time that David wrote Psalm 34, while he was hiding in a cave. And you remember that Saul, excuse me, David had two opportunities to kill Saul. But he held his his hand. He refrained from hurting Saul because he said, God forbid that I should harm the Lord's anointed. The Lord's anointed in this case was an insane king named Saul. David was basically saying, I will not take God's plan into my own hands and force it to work. I will wait and suffer under the present circumstances in exile in this cave until God brings about his plan the way that he wants to bring it about. And so David became a peacemaker in the nation of Israel. He was a blameless peacemaker. Notice what the text says in verse number 10. He's quoting from Psalm 34. Whoever desires to love life and see good days. What does that mean? It means that a Christian isn't a stick in the mud. Christians aren't afraid to have fun. Christians are truly the only ones who know how to live. And they don't need to get high or drunk to do it. They enjoy life in their right mind. You say, that's unfair. I got saved out of an alcohol culture, a drug culture. And our parties never got into full swing until most people were intoxicated and half out of their minds. And they used to think that was living. If you have to take three days to recover from living, you weren't living, you were dying. And this text says, it's Christians who make Jesus Lord, who really get to live life to the full. Do you desire to love life and see good days? Of course I do. I desire to see good days. Now, How do you reconcile the fact that Peter is addressing a group of people who are going through uh, mind-bending persecution. How do, you, how do you explain that? Because even under stressful circumstances, Christians see good days and experience the life of the overcoming life of God in their journey. That's how you explain it. This isn't a promise that you'll have problem-free life. It's a promise that God's life that overcomes all setbacks And all burdens is deeply planted in your life. That's what he's promising. Now, now what does he say? He simply, he asks the question, do you love life and do you want to see good days? Keep your tongue. Hold your tongue. My grandma used to say that. Hold your tongue, young man. Do you ever try to hold your tongue? It's absolutely, it's a slippery little member, isn't it? It's a devious little member. The text says the evidence of the lordship of Christ over my life is that I don't speak lies and I don't mislead people with my words. I don't tell them one thing when it's another. I speak the truth all the time. Doesn't mean I have to tell everybody everything I think. But it does mean when I speak, you should be able to believe what I tell you. He says it, doesn't he? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. I wish I had time. I can't believe how much time I've already used. I would take you over to Matthew chapter 12 and remind you that Jesus said on the day of judgment, every one of us will give an account for the idle words that we have spoken. And it is out of the fountain of the heart that the mouth speaks. So make the heart good. Make the heart good was Jesus' point. I'll talk about that more in a few minutes. Make the heart good, and your mouth will be full of good words. He goes on to say, turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. You see that? That's a peacemaker. Somebody who doesn't add words like a log on a fire to separate people, to divide people. There's some people who are expert at dropping just the right morsel of gossip on a fire so that it explodes. Christians are the ones who guard their lips. 
looking for an opportunity to speak a word that will bring reconciliation and forgiveness and healing. That's what the text is trying to tell us. Now notice what he says. He tells us in verse, uh, in verse 12, Look, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Peter is simply saying that our lives should be lived before the watchful eye of the Almighty. Now there are two ways where you can go with that principle. Watch this carefully. There are some angry Christians who will tell you, God's watching you to try and strike fear in your heart. And it is true. God is watching you. He sees everything. He hears everything. He records everything. He knows everything. You're not getting away with a single thing. Nor am I. But I don't think that's what Peter meant. Is it true that we will give an answer to the one who's been watching us from the day he designed us in our mother's womb? Yes. But that's not what this means. This means that as a father lovingly adores and watches and observes his children, so our heavenly Father has his eye upon us. I'm speaking as a father. I watch my kids' mannerisms with real delight and think to myself, they have no clue. That's just like an uncle that they've never met. I watch their every movement. I listen to the influx of their voices. I'm intrigued by the stories they tell. I love the way that they laugh because... They are all valuable to me. They mean more to me than life itself. That's how God is watching us. That's what this text means. Nothing in your life has transpired that God Almighty has not watched with affection and love and interest. And he's saying maybe to the angels, have you watched that girl lately? Oh, I'm so proud of her. I love her. She's unique. Oh, she's unique. You should see her. Come and watch. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ear is open to their prayer. As soon as we say, Father, he's bent his ear to our cry. So if we really are living under the lordship of Christ, we're harmless Christians. We are, we are blameless peacemakers. Number three, let me show you in verses 13 and 14. You will be a fearless overcomer. You saw that, didn't you, when we were reading? You will be a fearless overcomer. In verse number 13, he says, Who can harm you if you're zealous for good works? What he means to say is it doesn't matter who's giving you grief. If you have a heart that is zealous for good, you're honoring God. You don't have to worry about a thing. You're more than an overcomer through him who loved you so. Church family, you're tracking with me? I want Christ to be honored as Lord in all of our hearts, in all of our lives, in our family, our finances, and our faith, and our futures, and our, and our jobs. And it means that we will be zealous for the things that he loves. What it means is, just watch the men in this church who are zealous for the hockey playoffs. That's cool, isn't it? I enjoy watching people get fired up about sports. Uh, we lived in Indianapolis for a short time, and I remember sitting on the top level of the Pacers Stadium. It, it, I don't know how many tens of thousands there were, and I was up on the very top near the roof, and the, uh, the, um, the hurricane alarms, uh, is that what, a hurricane? Tornado alarms. They have tornado alarms everywhere in the Midwest. The tornado alarms started going off, and I'm looking around thinking nobody seems to be bothered at all. <laughs> so I turned to my buddy and says, can you hear that? He said, yes, yeah, just the tornado alarms. And I said, just the tornado alarms? I want out of here. I want out of here. He said, oh, calm down. There's no better way to die than die at a basketball game. <laughs> Every time those alarms went off, we would book it to our basement. I would hide under the sofa. I think it's cool to watch people get... You know what? I like, I'm inspired when I watch the way that some of you are zealous about your job. And I think you should be zealous about your job. I think it's great. 
I, I love watching you get, get up Monday morning, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, and you can't wait to get to work to tackle the first project because you love producing with the gifts that God has given upon your life. That's great. That's wonderful. I love watching some of you be zealous about pursuing your favorite thing on the earth. But the question is, do you pursue the goodness of God with the same zealous zeal? Do you pursue loving God and loving what is good with the same kind of passion? Listen to me. If you're not, you're not honoring Christ, the Lord, in your heart. You can't. You can't. So he says, you'll be zealous for good and you will patiently suffer whatever God plans for your life. Don't you love that word in verse number 14? He says, the person who is honoring Christ as Lord in their heart will be fearless. He says, have no fear of them, nor be troubled. I don't have to worry about a thing when my God is in control. I'm going to trust him the whole way. You mind if I just mention quickly in passing, I won't say a lot about it, but I want to draw your attention to the attitude that we should have toward the culture that is hostile toward God. Because Peter is saying, uh, don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid of the culture. And don't be indifferent to the culture. That seems to be the two extremes of the church today. Some people feel like God himself must be dead for the horrible things that are happening in the world. I hear Christians all the time moaning about the state of the church. And it's right to moan about the state of the church. It is deplorable. The church in Canada may be at its weakest point in the history of our country. The body of Christ is not shining like a light. The word is not being held out. We are not making a dent in the darkness of our culture. But we don't need to live in fear of the culture. And we so certainly don't need to be indifferent to the culture. So Peter says you will be a fearless overcomer. Fourthly and lastly, you will be a tireless witness. That's in verses 15, 16, and 17. Church family, hold in there with me, will you? Uh, I tried not to shout, but I did. I couldn't help it. I'm praying God will give me restraint on my voice, but I've got to get through this last point because it may be one of the most important things that Peter says in the text. Do you know what he's saying in this passage? He's saying that as a Christian, you live in such a compelling way that people have to ask you, what's different about you? Peter's point is, you must be a tireless witness, and the way that you produce the opportunity to witness for Christ is by living in such a unique way that people say, there's something different about that man. He's not like all the other employees in my company. She's not like all the other workers in this, in, in this organization. That lady is not like the rest of my neighbors. There's, there's a friendliness, there's a kindness, there's a, there's a spiritual beauty in that person's life that I don't see in anybody else's life. That's Peter's point. Peter's point isn't, you all need to be able to be evangelists. You need to know how to defend the faith. Is that in the text? Of course it's in the text. But that's not his main point. His main point is people watching you live in such a way that they will say, I have to get a private moment, moment allow, alone with that man to find out what makes him tick. And in that moment, you get to give him a defense, an explanation of the reason for the hope that lies within you. I, wonder, I couldn't help but wonder, is our church that compelling? Would people rub shoulders with us and say, oh my, something unusual going on in that place. They're really different. Not weird different, but different, beautifully different. I want to be able to ask somebody in that church, what makes you people tick? Peter says, you should be always prepared. Some of you know that April and I just came back from Washington, D.C., and one of the first museums that we visited was the National Archives Museum, it was spellbounding for me to go into the room where are held the Declaration of Independence when the Americans realized they didn't want to have uh, uh, um, uh, uh, whatever with the British. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
the Declaration of Human Rights, in that same building was a gift copy of the Magna Carta that was written in 1200 upon which the, the uh, Constitution of the United States was written, which declares the liberty and justice for all people around the globe, not just Americans. The Americans weren't the first ones to talk about liberty and justice, but when you come outside of the National Archives, there's this giant statue. He looks like a Greek god. He's got bulging muscles, and when you follow the platform down to the bottom, you'll see the words, peace, excuse me, eternal vigilance is the cost of liberty. Did you hear what I said? Eternal vigilance is the cost of liberty. It means if we get indifferent to the liberties that we have, we could lose them. Peter's simply saying, eternal vigilance is the cost of being a witness for Jesus Christ. I'm always ready to tell somebody what God has done in my heart. To explain to them about the hope that I have in Jesus Christ. Church family, you still with me? Wave at me if you are. You're helping me get through, aren't you? Listen now. The word that Peter uses for defense here is a very important word. It means a reason, thought out explanation for why you know Jesus and love Jesus and follow Jesus. It's absolutely unacceptable to tell people, I'm a Christian because I believe the Bible. It's not enough. You should know your Bible. And if you are a follower of Jesus, you should be able to explain when someone says to you, why are you a follower of Jesus, what would you say? I have ten things that I have learned that I could say immediately. What would you say? Peter says you be ready to explain in a reasonable way. That means, he adds, doesn't he? He says with gentleness and respect. Lots of people who think they are evangelists for Christ go around the countryside turning everybody off. They are an embarrassment to Christ and the church. They continually inflame with words of condemnation and accusation. Peter says, when you tell someone why you have hope in Christ, you better have a well thought out argument and you should do it with the utmost respect. Get to know the person. Think about who they are. Don't use inflammatory language. There's a Baptist church in the United States called Westboro Baptist that is a shame to the whole world, an embarrassment to the body of Christ. They walk around the town carrying signs that say death to all faggots. They're a gross embarrassment to us all. Now let me say this. The American media is equally foolish for singling out one person or group of people that say they represent Christ. Because there are hundreds and thousands of other reasoned answers to the culture. You, you understand what I'm saying this morning? You better be prepared. Some of you are trying to tell your neighbors what difference Jesus has made in your life. And they don't see it yet. It's better for you just to keep your mouth shut for a little while. Until they see the difference he's made, you have no right. But when they finally see the compelling evidence of your life, you start to tell them what Jesus has done, who he is, where he came from, why you believe the Bible, why you love the church, why you're committed to the good of all men as a Christian. So he says, we are to be tireless witnesses who are continually telling of Jesus Christ's amazing grace. So the question is not, is Jesus Lord? He's already Lord. He doesn't need me or you or the world to crown him Lord. He's already Lord. The question is, do I live every day in the reality that my words and my actions, my choices and my decisions are ruled and controlled by my knowledge that I love Him and that He is my Lord. He is my Savior. He's the one who took me by the hand and said, I forgive you of all of your sins. I will be forever grateful that He did that for me. But He's not just my Savior. He is my Lord. It means what He says, I will do it. 
Where he sends me, I need to go. When he rebukes me, I listen. He's my Lord. But follow me carefully. He can't be your Lord until you've had a change of heart and you need a change of heart. That's why Paul wrote in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Je- the Je- excuse me, Jesus as Lord and believe where? In your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. You cannot confess Jesus as Lord until you have had a change of heart. And you cannot earn a change of heart. You can only experience a change of heart by the coming and power of the Holy Spirit. You cannot change your own heart by good works. You cannot change your heart by hours and hours and hours of praying and sacrifice. You cannot change your own heart by any effort of your own. It is only by the coming of the Holy Spirit. And if you would be honest enough with yourself and be truthful about the condition of your own heart, you know it needs to be changed. Your heart gives you more grief than you would ever admit. And you need a new heart. And you can only confess Jesus Christ as Lord in salvation or life transformation by the power of the Holy Spirit. Where does that leave us? I know exactly where it leaves us. It leaves us at the feet of the Holy Spirit. And we say to Him, I need you to save me. I need you to change me. I need you to energize me with love for God and obedience to his word. Because the Holy Spirit is the only one who can do that. Jesus said in Luke chapter 11, If you then, being evil, give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? See, some of us have been trying to live like Jesus is Lord through the effort of our own flesh. We know full well that we have not been changed in the heart where God sees where change must really take place in the inner man, in the unseen person, in the invisible me, where only God and I know what is really going on and who I really am. The Holy Spirit comes in a miracle of grace and He saves me and He continually pours the love of God in my heart so I can make Jesus the Lord over all of my life. Will you pray with me, please? Just in the quietness of this room, would you, would you talk to him about the state of your heart? Would you talk to him about the real you that you know you are? Would you stop being afraid? Stop trying to be somebody else? Get real with God. Tell him about your heart. Maybe you'll find out like John Wesley did after many years of serving Christ. I'm not even saved yet. He was trying to save himself through all of his good works. Finally realized, I'm I'm not saved and I've been preaching. Would Would you dare look into your own heart this morning and say, Lord, show me my true condition, the state of my inner man. Show me where I really am. Just talk to him about where you are. Maybe you know that you've become a part of God's family. Maybe you know that. But you need a deeper work of grace in your heart to transform you. Then ask the Holy Spirit to give you a change of heart today. We used to sing it in a simple chorus, Lord. Change my heart, O God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O God. May I be like you. And I pray today that the Holy Spirit, as God himself, will come and brood over every human heart in this place today, showing us the true condition of our inner man. Lord, I can't help but wonder if there are people in this room who are religious but lost. They're even members of this church, but they're far from you. They can't really say that I know that I have been transformed in the inner man. They've altered their appearance. They've changed their behavior. They work hard at saying the right things, but they know deep down inside there's a lack of the Spirit's work. Then I pray that you would show them today, and today would be the day of salvation by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then, Lord, 
I'm very afraid of pastoring a church of people who are good people for sure, the best, but who don't really act in reality like Jesus is Lord of their personal lives, their private lives, their marriages, their jobs, their money, their testimony, their friendships. And I pray that you would be honored as Lord in all of our hearts today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.